ultra thrilled about the, the topic of, of this presentation. Um, and, and I'm hoping to learn a bunch of stuff that I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So, well, I know we all will. So take it away. Now the pressure is on. Right? Okay, so we're going to talk about tongue tying, paleocentrical therapy, and I want to preface this by saying that. This is new territory in terms of utilizing cranial sacral therapy specifically to address the concerns that come up either as comorbidities or with tongue type per se. And so this is, I don't have any definitive answers, and I'm really hoping that for those of you who are working with tongue type babies that you can, you know, contribute to this discussion so that we can see what kind of common ground are we seeing emerging here to get a better sense of, uh, number one, how can we communicate this better to people who are in the position of um, diagnosing and treating tongue tie, um, but number two, so that we can be better at saying this is the kind of result that we can expect under these circumstances, perhaps, okay? So um, just feel free to chime in with your experiences in working with this. Um, all right, I'm going to do a disclosure here only because I want you to see this particular video. Uh -oh. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Ultimately, I'm not sure that at the end of the day, it's really going to matter if it's a tongue-tie related restriction or whatever, and, and because I'm not sure myself if those kinds of fine distinctions need to be made yet, okay? And that's because in reality, in my own practice, I don't see tongue-tie as often as other lactation consultants see tongue tie. And so really it's about three to four percent. And I'm working with the absolute worst possible cases. And it's not because people in my community are better at um, diagnosing, I don't think. I think we have an overdiagnosis problem. Me too. Yes. At this Me point. Too. I'm kind of coming from this place now Me too. and being very concerned about it. Okay? So as we go along here, I'm, I'm, I'm a champion for treating what's actually there. I am not a champion for just treating willy nilly without making a differential diagnosis. Okay. So. Why do you think that it, the overdiagnosis? Here's what I think is happening. I think that the people who are on the front line of working with infant suck aren't well prepared to really understand what they're looking at. We've got a real skill of, uh, education deficit in lactation circles. Okay? You can study didactically and read a bunch of books and pass the exam. They're, they're not tested on any clinical component. Okay, and so that means anybody can become an IBCLC whether they have good solid clinical training or not. And, and so I'm afraid we've gotten into a kind of a backed into a corner situation where, oh my gosh, tongue tight. This is a really convenient um, rubric to put these uh, various sucking problems and dump that right in, into that rubric. And you know what, because I don't know how to fix this, I'm going to send them to the cranial sacral therapist because cranial sacral therapy has become the flavor of the day yeah. in lactation yeah. circles, okay? <laughs> and without even, even any real understanding of what it is that cranial sacral therapy <clears throat> is or does. Now, I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing, so I'm not making a judgment <laughs> on that, but I think we have more work to do, okay? So, I, does that answer that question? Yeah. All right, thank you. And I've been called very opinionated, so. <laughs> yes, it is, perfect. Thank you. Now, 
want you to look at this beautiful creature and think about mobility, flexibility, and stability. It's a lingual frenulum because a lingual frenulum is not the same thing as a tongue tie. This is the thing that aggravates the crap out of me. Turn to your neighbor and lift your tongue up. Is the, is the kind of vernacular. 
um, occurs when this tissue fails to recede <coughs> enough to allow optimal mobility of the tongue. Okay, and leaves in its way a short and or tight lingual frenulum that is going to affect tongue function. So this then tells us what the definition is. Maybe. So, it's an embryological remnant of tissue in the midline between the undersurface of the tongue and the floor of the mouth that restricts normal tongue movement. It is a functional definition, not an appearance definition. Okay, now we saw in Meg's wonderful presentation what normal babies can do. They're going to self-attach in the first hour, self-arouse, orient, and then be fed. They perfectly coordinate suck, swallow, and breathe. They transfer milk efficiently, and they can maintain good oxygen saturation while they're doing all of this. This is really awesome. The tongue-tied baby, that's if they're right, not drugged beyond, you know, anything and tortured in the process of childhood. Okay, so this is what normal is. Tongue-tied babies can't do all of this to one degree or another. Okay, so good suck, swallow, breathe coordination is going to happen 30 to 60 times a minute, 20 to 60 minutes per feed, and 10 to 12 times per day minimum. That's a lot of coordination that has to go on in order for the baby to get in enough to eat and survive, right? Okay, so the tongue tie, the deficits can interfere with this normal trajectory here and make feeds very inefficient. So, our complex coordination of suck, swallow, and breathe involves layers and layers of tissue, connected tissue. 60 plus some muscles, 22 cranial bones, 34 articulations, and multiple physiological functions. Okay? And that's just if we sort of localize things to like right in here. Right? Okay. We, we now know we're working really holistically with the entire body when we're working with the tongue tongue. Okay. So. What do tongue-tied babies do that's not normal? <coughs> Sorry, my mouse is not working. Oh. So, they're going to have impaired milk transfer. They will have an insufficient latch. They may have a continuous feed cycle. What a continuous feed cycle is, is basically that they are going to breast, not transferring milk well, and then pooping out at some point, but not quite able to go to sleep because they're still hungry. And when it appears as if they're done, mom takes the baby off, they wake back up, and they want to go back on. Or they stay at breast and they are constantly feeding. They're just feeding, 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 and then sometime in the evening, late evening, they may just pass out from sheer exhaustion. This insufficient latch and insufficient milk intake is results oftentimes in a compromised milk supply, but not always. It may result in nipple compression syndrome, and we're going to see what that actually looks like in terms of the, um, uh, the crimping uh, and uh, brutalization of the nerve in the breast as a result of the hypertonicity in the mouth. Nipple and breast damage, compromised weight gain and growth, and all told, not many mothers are going to withstand this for very long, and so we have huge attrition rate with this, and, and the mothers will prematurely wean their babies. Okay, so we end up with a formula-fed, bottle-fed baby. Okay, now. We, we talked about the suck physiology. One of the things that I forgot to mention to you all is that the epiglottis which is the structure that is down here near the highway. Oh, this thing was right in here. What happens
happens is as this tongue ramps back, it actually lifts up. The tongue, tongue root lifts up, and it lifts the larynx with it. And the epiglottis, which is the cartilage that forms at the same time as the root of the tongue during the embryogenesis, actually drops over, folds over really beautifully. And it doesn't completely block the glottis, but it, it just enough so that the food doesn't go down into the larynx. So we have this, this just beautiful action of the larynx being pulled forwards and upwards at the same time that the tongue is being pulled up and starts to ramp back to push the bolus, and then this beautiful epiglottis just coming right down and folding over and protecting the airway like so. Okay. Well, you can imagine if you've got a restriction in the front of the tongue that what ends up happening is that we don't get this really nice pull. Okay? And because of the restrictions, we all also may have a larynx that's deviated slightly, and that's a real common occurrence, is that that larynx is off to one side. And so when the epiglottis tries to come down and do its fold over and really protect the airway, <laughs> we've got a little miss. And so in an effort to protect the airway, the baby starts to do thrusting and all kinds of other things and um, lots of uh, sputtering and gagging and choking and coughing and all of that kind of thing in order to keep the milk on from going down in the food. Now when the structures in the throat become less opposed, opposed with growth, then we have a greater problem. So even though a tongue-tied baby in the early weeks and up to the first maybe four or five months, may be able to uh, compensate for this adequately in order to prevent aspiration. Once that neck elongates, all of a sudden they start having difficulty swallowing. And so at that point, we may see problems happening with solid foods. <coughs> so in England, for example, they are only allowed to treat tongue tie if it is impacting infant feeding early on. They're not allowed to clip for any other reason. So they can't clip if the baby could potentially have problems with solid foods. The clipping would have to happen if that presented. So they can't even do it as a prevention measure. <clears throat> so obviously they're not thinking developmentally there when, they're, when they've made their rules and regulations about uh, clipping or not clipping. You know, all, just, although generally speaking, they're really darn good at clipping for uh, newborn feeding issues. Okay, so does that all make sense then? Okay, so now we've seen the barium swallow, we've seen all the Woolridge stuff, but I'm going to go through and um, uh, do the Woolridge ultrasound again. I'm going to pause it at a certain spot, and I'm going to talk to you about what ends up happening down in here with this valving mechanism with the tongue-tied baby. Does that sound good? Okay. <coughs> Okay, can everybody see this okay? Okay, good. So, okay, breast right here, tongue right here, okay? You're going to have timing issues. Well, first of all, you're going to have an issue with this valve mechanism right in here. Okay, it's not going to generate the kind of negative pressure that we need in order to be able to draw the milk, open up the, the uh, nipple pores, and draw the milk out and bring it back to this place. Additionally, if you've got a tie that's right underneath here, at uh, more towards the tip, you're not going to get a good valve right in here because the tongue's not going to be able to lift up and um, really maintain a good seal around the breast at this place. Thank you. Okay, so now then with the nasopharynx, we may have mistiming issues so that the signaling that's going on here that would tell the nasopharynx when it has to draw back like this, in tandem with the tongue lifting up and the epiglottis dropping down over the airway, then we don't have this valve working either. 
And so these babies can oftentimes get milk coming up, refluxing into this area, and sometimes we even see them snotting it out their, their nostrils. Okay? That's a problem. Yes? I, I do notice that sometimes babies who are pentide also have a very sensitive gang reflex. Absolutely. And so, so fine. Yes, uh -huh. absolutely. Okay, so their sensory, there's just all this kind of weird sensory stuff going on where they're misinterpreting whether or not they need to protect the airway at that level. Right? Yeah. Okay, so then we're going to have another problem when we, when, with this valving down here at the epiglottis. Because it's not dropping over, especially with the deviating larynx, now we don't have a really good valving mechanism that is protecting the airway. And then because the larynx isn't pulling up adequately and correctly and moving out of the way in order to open up the back of the throat for the food to come down into the esophagus, now that valve is a problem. So we're going to commonly see with tongue tie all this arrhythmical stuff going on with all kinds of um, oxygen crap and breathing problems and then this baby just kind of being really agitated at breast. Okay? I'm using these qualifiers. I don't know why I'm qualifying this. They have problems. <laughs> and they get agitated. And sometimes they get so agitated that they decide, I'm not doing this anymore. And so they withdraw and they just refuse to breastfeed. Okay? All right. Big problem. So when Woolrich comes out, or you know, I wish that uh, we could get a hold of Kathy <coughs> Jenna's um, ultrasound studies. She's not, um, they're not available for some reason, I don't know why. But um, uh, you know, when Woolrich does his next study, which he's doing on tongue tie, he's gonna have ultrasound scans of tongue tie babies. We'll see exactly, wow, look at the differences between what's normal and what a tongue tie baby looks like. And to me, that's all the evidence you need. Right? You do a few ultrasound studies and all of a sudden you see, oh, okay, there are our compromises. That makes sense now that we're clipping. Because one of our controversies is um, whether or not, you know, that this even needs to be treated. Whether or not it exists, first of all, and whether or not it has any kind of negative impact. So we're really kind of um, uh, having a battle when it comes to certain uh, primary care providers in getting on board to help us to do this. Mm -hmm. Now, if it's in your scope, scope of practice to clip, by all means, clip. And as I understand it, chiropractors have the ability to do this? Yeah. It's not in your scope? Yeah. Okay. So, and if I had my way, lactation consultants in this country would be able to go and get training and this would be in our scope of practice. Because if we're the one-stop shop in the early postpartum period, then we really should be able to do this, okay? This should not remain in the realm of medical diagnosis because the medical practitioners are the ones who are least likely to diagnose this, okay? They're the ones who are looking up and saying, no, we don't want to do this. Okay, so that's our series of valves that get messed up. <coughs> So what will we see the baby doing? Well, they're going to have their tongue motion deficits, as we talked about. The tongue is going to protect the airway. We'll have poor suck swallow breathe coordination, clamping or cliff hanging. And this is what I see happening with a baby who's doing a lot of tongue pumping. And when they go to latch, first of all, they're not gaping very well. But when they do gape and get on, they start to gag back here because the back of their mouth, the vestibule at the back, is already filled up with tongue. And to add the breast into it, or even a bottle, means, oh my god, there's too much stuff back here. I can't handle it. I'm going to gag it out. Or I'm going to slip off the breast incrementally down here, and I'm going to suck down here. And the result of that is that I'm going to brutalize the nipple tip or right behind, and I'm going to create neuralgia, which is that burning, biting, um, shooting pain that typically happens at the end of the feed, okay? That's a mistake for this diagnosis, is thrush. 
Okay, so we talked about coffee and sputtering, poor milk transfer, of course, since the baby drives the system, right? They're not going to be taking milk off, continuous cycle feeding, and the whole host of other things, ultimately perhaps resulting in premature weaning. And that's exactly what we don't want to have happen. Okay, so there will be latch changes as well. This baby was one of my students who, this baby was about three weeks old when she came to a class, and um, she put the baby on, and I was kind of glancing over, and I kind of went, ooh, And so um, she asked me, she said, I'm, I, I'm really having problems. This doesn't feel like my first baby. And she said, will you take a look? And so I took a look, and I said, can I get a picture of that? <laughs> because your baby's not getting on deeply enough because your baby's tongue tied. And she says, I kind of suspected that, but I really wasn't really quite sure. So she went home, and fortunately, she had a practitioner in her community who would clip. And she came back only a few weeks later. I saw this next picture. What a difference. Look how relaxed and easy that baby is at rest. Instead of being all uh, and uh, uh, you know, all tight at rest. Now, this was happening at a time prior to epidurals. So, and prior to some of the childbirth stuff. This is like back in you know the 80s when we were still doing natural childbirth, and uh, people were really into it. And the whole marketing thing at maternity wards was, we do natural childbirth here. We're not going to interfere with your birth and all of this kind of stuff. And so we didn't have really any comorbidities here. Once this baby got clipped, that was it. It went to breast and it did a bang up job. And the breastfeeding alone was the exercise needed in order to correct any kind of weaknesses in the um, tongue organ, OK? Now we have a much more complex scenario emerging. And that makes um, uh, getting a result like this a lot more difficult. Okay? And sometimes we think that our phenomenon has failed. And it hasn't really failed. It's just that there are all these comorbid things going on. And that the phenomenon is only one piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so some of the maternal issues will be that she, mom can be really frustrated if she has continued. Okay, and in my area, we have a supposedly a 75% initiation rate, but the number of mothers that make it to one week or two weeks is more like 5%. Wow. Okay. Are hmm? No, no, no. I mean breastfeeding in general. Wow. <clears throat> okay, so unlike, you know, your situation, yeah. Yeah, you have really great continuity of care for yeah. 6,000 births. That's awesome, and plus the community around you. Yeah. You know, in Columbus, we've got, you know, one hospital that has uh, about half of the number of births. They have a team of lactation consultants there. I mean, they've got six. They've got bedside care. They have follow-up care, et cetera. They want to be baby-friendly. Their epidural rate is 99%. They are known as the most horrible hospital in the community for having a baby. And I'm like, that one, I don't know how you guys are going to make it because your rates are atrocious, absolutely atrocious. So this is, I know it's shocking to people when you're used to being in a, in a community where everybody's being supportive and, you know, yeah. this is all, et cetera. But really, it's pretty lousy where I am, okay? And it's amazing to me that I actually have a practice because I see the absolute most dedicated mothers who have the education and the money to spend to come and see me and who are going to stick with it come hell or high water. Okay? Or the babies that are suspected of being tongue tied and they're sent to me specifically so that I can make an appropriate diagnosis. Okay, so frustration, big thing with moms, and it's amazing that they, they um, persist. Milk stasis issues because the baby's not taking the milk off. Uh, resentment, reduced supply, helplessness, breast soreness, undermined self-confidence. This is a big one. You don't have self-confidence in breastfeeding. Well, okay, that's going to undermine the whole process. And nipple compression and damage. So here's what nipple compression looks like. This is healing, okay? Do you 
want, I mean, usually in a lactation audience, you hear the, <gasps> the intake of breath, the wince, you know, oh my God, that is horrible. Okay, well, this isn't even as horrible as it actually gets. Mm -hmm. Right, ladies? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. So here's what I'm looking at. Do you see this wound here? Yes. That is a third degree wound that's healing. Okay, it's got some good granulation going on here. That was wider open. Okay, remember, wounds on the nipple are exquisitely painful. This is like, I imagine, getting kicked in the balls like over and over again. You know, it really, really hurts. And every time the baby goes on, there's this renewed cycle of pain. Okay, so that's pretty darn bad. Here's our nipple compression stripe. This is a very typical blanching, post-feed. We've also got a little bit of thrushy stuff going on here in addition to it. But we've got inflammation that extends, you know, uh, way far out. This is problematic. And, and we've got inflammation in the underlying tissue. So the nerve is inflamed as well, which is part of the pain cycle there. So that neuralgia is only contributes to the actual feet pain. And then afterwards, the mother is also experiencing exquisite pain with this neuralgia. Okay, so on this one here, we've got um, pretty substantial tissue breakdown with the, with the scap formation over it. Okay, if, if she had continued, this would have gotten worse and worse. But we've arrested it at this point by getting her the proper help. Now, part of the treatment process is going to be to initiate some wound healing uh, for the nipples and maybe even doing some uh, breast rest where we take the baby off the breast in order to allow some of the worst stuff to heal up before mom puts the baby back on. It just kind of depends on what the mother's goals are and how bad the wound is. Yes? Do you, do you um, take them to feed at that point? Or do you want yeah, we'd use an alternative feed method that is going to be therapeutic. Okay, so that's going to help to achieve the ultimate therapeutic goal of getting the baby back on. And that might be a bottle, it might be finger feeding, it might be, you know, cup feeding, although I don't really use cup feeding in my practice. Um, but, you know, there are, there are different ways to go about doing it. Yeah. Can you tell us, sorry, just the brush, like how you can see right away that this brush is in shine to the uh, yeah, you're going to have shiny, flaky skin. Um, there's kind of a raw, um, broken glass feeling to the pain as well. And you might have shooting pain with, uh, with a bad case. Um, in the baby's mouth, of course, there may be some corresponding symptoms in the baby. Mom may have a vaginal yeast infection. Baby may have a yeast diaper rash, or it may have characteristic signs of thrush in the mouth. <laughs> It may be even subclinical where you just see a mother with pearl look to the mucous membrane. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, the lactation consultant is always looking for all these comorbid things. You know, so our assessment is not just going to be about the tongue tying, it's going to be the whole bubble wax. But I think it's worthwhile that when a mother comes in as a craniosacral therapist, if you're getting dumped on, like the lactation consultant doesn't know what to do, but they know a craniosacral therapist is going to be helpful then you it kind of inherit the thing, and you're in a position where you have to kind of go, okay, are there other issues here that are not going to improve with the craniosacral therapy? So now I'm going to have to refer either to another lactation consultant or to somebody I know who's going to be able to um, take care of the other comorbidities. Um, so that if she's complaining of stabbing pain, then you must also keep in your head this notion that maybe there is also thrush here, even though maybe not. You know? And so I don't think it's wrong for the cranial sacral therapist to take a quick peek at the baby's diaper area, um, its mouth, um, while you're working on the baby to see if there's any telltale signs, or to take a quick look at the mom's nipple. You know? I think that's okay to do that. Um, all right, so now, breastfeeding isn't the only thing that's impacted by tongue tie. Butterfly babies have the exact same kinds of problems except for the milk transfer thing. Because the method of milk delivery is different than breastfeeding and it's just going to keep on going into the baby's mouth. 
So the baby isn't going to have necessarily the weight gain problems or the milk transfer issues. The problem with that is the baby defending their airway against this constant steady flow of milk. And that is problematic for the baby. Okay? So, but they're going to have some of the exact same manifestations. So a common myth is that bottle feeding is going to rectify this problem, ergo we don't have to clip. No, bottle feeding is not going to rectify the problem because this is a functional issue. I don't know when weight gain became the barometer for infant health. You know, it's like that's the data point that's looked at. <coughs> I think some failure to thrive babies back in the time when everybody was bottle feeding were actually tongue-tied babies. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, of primary importance is tongue function. And this is something that I really have gone around the world trying to impress upon people that the parents is secondary. Looky here. We have three tongue-tied babies. Do they look alike? No. no. Can we tell from these pictures which ones are more severely affected than another? No, you cannot tell from just looking alone. Okay? However, it can, these appearance characteristics of tongue tie can buttress a functional assessment so that you can determine if you've got tongue tie as the sucking problem or if you've got some other type of sucking problem. Okay? So it can help you make a differential diagnosis because another type of sucking problem, even though there will be similar functional deficits, won't look this way. Yep. How is that one tongue tied? That's a posterior to something else. So with the posterior tie, the issue will be that the tongue won't be able to actually go move forward? Uh, with any tongue tie, there will be deficits with tongue extrusion. Okay, so here we have a bunch more tongue ties. An amazing range of presentations. And this is why there's so much argument. Because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the uh, literature will claim that this heart shaped look here is tongue tie. That's how they define tongue tie by the heart shape. And so the incident statistics that came out of those studies would be like less than 1%, which makes sense to me because the heart shape presentation is about less than 50% of the time when you see that presentation. Okay. I, uh, there was one person who was doing a talk that said that a posterior tie had the worst, um, it was the worst presentation of time time. It's not. There can be anterior ties that can really create more functional problems than the posterior tie. So it's really important not to get locked into these notions about what, what you're going to find correlation-wise if you see a certain appearance. Okay, so now with our posteriors, all that posterior means is that the location of the frenulum is back more towards the base of the tongue. Mm -hmm. That's all that means. There's no magic in the terminology. Okay? What was really significant with um, the watson jenna Carlos work is that they discovered the submucosal type, where the frenulum is located underneath, and we're going to see the video now of what that looks like. See how that pops out? <coughs> so you really have to lift the tongue up and get under there and pull it up. So. Yeah, when you're doing an assessment, you really got to get your fingers underneath there and push back against the tongue base to see the cord mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. pop out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you know that the tongue tie versus mm -hmm. the front? Well, that's a frenulum, but you have to do your functional deficit. So here they're just looking and seeing that that is a short but elastic 
frenulum there. Okay, so, you know, in this particular case, that was an actual tongue tie because it had already been diagnosed and he was treating. He wears a little camera on his head, so every baby that comes in for a phrenotomy, he's taking video of them. So they've already been diagnosed. So that alone wouldn't tell you that it's tongue tie? No, you couldn't, no, you couldn't just go like that. But you, a part of what you want to do is if you don't actually see a visible frenulum, you want to go back and press to see if there's actually one that's submucosal. And then from there, you'll do your functional assessment and determine whether or not there's a problem. Was he treating a nail work then? Uh, no, he, he actually uses a laser okay. to clip those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Larry. Um, I think he's real observant about classification. It's not the same thing as assessment, though. Okay, he's typing, so he's giving little qualities to it, but, you know, that's not the same as doing a thorough functional assessment. But he's a surgeon, so he's looking at it from a surgeon's perspective. Okay, now, one of the characteristic signs of a posterior tie is going to be the dimple. That's right in here. Can you see it? Okay. So um, this is um, a little bit hard to see, but once you've seen it, it kind of imprints on your head in real life, you know, and, and you'll be able to pick up on it then as you look at more and more of these. But unfortunately, you can also have a vertical pull on the underside of the tongue from restrictions in the throat, like with condylar migration or laryngeal deviation um, from a cord wrapped around the neck. Um, I've seen these from reach babies are pulling on that deep fascia and they're pulling all of this downward and so it tightens up the frenulum and you can also get this little dimple. So we have kind of a problem in being able to determine whether or not we have an actual tongue tie when we have these comorbid um, issues. Okay, so how do we do an assessment? Well, the research-based tool is based on research that I did for my master's degree that resulted in the assessment tool for lingual frenulum function. And this is what's being used globally now to assess for function in newborn babies. Um, and I have a whole talk that goes over how to use it properly, etc. Did I send handout time to you? Mm -hmm. Oh, crap, you well, if anybody, <laughs> two, ways, two ways to get the actual chart for the assessment tool. One is from the book, which it's in the appendices, so if you're inclined to take a peek, here's the book, you can come to ask around. Um, and um, the other way is for you to email me, and I'd be happy to send you the chart. You have my permission to use it in your own practice. Mm -hmm. You don't have permission to attenuate it. It's based on three years of research and went through a very rigorous process of being constructed. And it is internally valid and it is um, has high enter rate of reliability on most of its items. Um, it's there's a new study going on in England where they're going to check for enter rate of reliability using it as it was supposed to be used as a screening tool. So we'll see what the results of that study are. Okay, so I want to make this distinction right now so that you're not confused. There's an awful lot of talk in lactation circles about this, that, and the other thing. We have the um, watson jenner Corlos typing system. That is a classification system. It is not an assessment, okay? It is just simply a way that we talk to one another about what we're seeing. Saying posterior anterior is a classification system. It's the same thing. We're just saying that there are some ties that appear closer to the tip of the tongue and some that appear closer to the base of the tongue. That's it. Those are very general categories, okay? So any kind of typing system like, um, uh, there are probably 10 of them out there, okay, that are classification systems. Those are not assessments, right? There are two research-based assessments with a third that is, was uh, started to be tested in uh, Brazil 
She is continuing on with that process. She did pilot study and she's continuing on and she may very well have a really viable um, assessment tool that can be used with older babies and children. So we'll see, she um, does uh, speech language study. Okay, so an assessment process is a process that is looking at certain parameters so that you can determine if function is optimal or what deficits there may be. A screening tool is one that it does an assessment, but is weeding out those people who have the phenomena from those people who do not. Okay? And the, here's the tool. Without the scoring part, this is a screening tool. This is meant to be used on every baby under three months of age. Okay? Bottle fed, breast fed. If they appear to be tongue-tied, if they don't appear to be tongue-tied, this is a screening tool that will weed out uh, the tongue-tied baby from the population of other babies and will help to make a differential diagnosis between a category of sucking problems versus a tongue-tied base sucking problem. Okay? And it contains a phrenotomy decision rule. So if you're inclined, I would encourage you to um, take a look at it and email me, and I'll be happy to send you a copy of the chart. Now, my email address is A-L-I-S-O-N-H-A-Z-E at AOL.com. Could you say that again a little slower? A-L-I-S-O-N-H-A-Z-E at AOL.com. Thank you. Okay, now this is the screen in action. That will really take long once you've learned how to use it. and actually lift up on the tongue if they're not 
opening their mouth wide enough and lifting their tongue up spontaneously to actually perform the lift so that you're looking at elasticity, length of the lingual frenulum at rest, um, and um, what the shape of the tongue is when you lift it. Okay, so what are you looking for as cranial sacral therapist? Structure and function. So I am looking at cranial base, I'm looking at the OA and the foramen magnum because what I have detected in these kids is that even the, it's going to cause a little bit of a torticollis tongue tie is and um, and I think that I'm suspecting that depends on which presentation they have as to which side is affected and I'm kind of using the term torticollis a little bit looser than maybe how it's defined because one time I had a tongue tie baby that I was not getting complete resolution with until I went in and I actually found one strand, one hair strand of foramen magnum that had not released and I went in there and I intentionally just went like this and released it and everything opened up. It was amazing to me and the baby had a head to head tilt that was holding in that position just simply because of that one little thing at the frame of magnum. So it made me go, maybe I need to be looking at the frame of magnum per se and get more detail about working with those fibers and those attachments in there. Mm -hmm. um, so I've really learned a lot as I've gone along and, and gone, okay, as a cranial sacral therapist, what am I specifically needing to do with a tongue tie baby? Pre-surgery and then post-surgery. Mm -hmm preparing them for phrenotomy, and then going back in and strengthening things that need to be strengthened or rectifying misalignments. So I also look at the ethmoid, the palate, the neck throat, and specifically the hyoid. Um, I'm looking at the sacrum and the hips because of that deep fascial line, and <coughs> I'm looking at CSR, valve control, sexual recoordination, state control, which is going to tell me a lot about the condition of the brain stem, Fascial motility along all the fascial lines. Okay, now there's more here, okay, that you could potentially do, but these were like some of the highlight things that I found to be patterns presenting with tongue tied babies. And next year, this list may look completely different. I don't know. <laughs> um, here is something really interesting. This is a cadaver class that I took, Julie McKay, and we had unfold cadavers. And um, this particular cranium didn't have a brain in it, but what we saw, so all that red granulation stuff is packing material, okay? So it's um, not something that was physiologic. <laughs> but see this right here? That's a strain pattern. How cool is that? To actually see a strain pattern in the dura here. And it, it just was like, oh, okay, now I can show this to lactation consultants and go, see, they really exist. And here's the marker of one in a cadaver. And who knows how long in his life he had had this, but um, you know, just think that much of a change in there, what amazing things was ha were happening throughout his entire body, just as a result of what appears to be something relatively minor. Can you put your little uh, light on again? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's pretty significant. <laughs> Allison, could you name those structures just so people can get a little better oriented to <clears throat> which part of it? <laughs> 
I, I'm not sure that everybody. I mean, I, can I, I have this. this slide in my presentation, if that matters. Mm -hmm. uh, and oh. I have it later on. This one okay. right here are the dissected out fascial lines that um, are from the anatomy trains video. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool work. I encourage you. Uh, Tom Meyer's mm -hmm. website has a ton of material on it. It's fascinating. And the ABMP has um, a bunch of webinars that he teaches. So for free, you can go and get an hour-long lesson from Tom Myers on this stuff and walk away with uh, your mind blown. Yeah. Uh, was <coughs> Thomas Myers is the anatomy trains guy. Yeah. Okay, so remember fascist prime. So a lot of my work when I'm assessing the tongue type baby is to go to the fascia first and just kind of feel my way around. And I'm going to show you a brief assessment that enables you to do that in a very quick, quick kind of fashion. And I'm trying to teach lactation consultants to do this very thing because, um, uh, you know, well, they need to. They just need to know how to do it and um, be confident in that and um, at least have a rudimentary understanding of what feels off so that they can feel more confident in referring to a, 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 um, a cranial sacral therapy. Okay. So I want to show you the deep line. That's this one here in this photo. Look at this. From the feet all the way up to the occiput. Ooh. How cool is that? <clears throat> that structure right in the center of the circle is the tongue. It, just take a minute to feel your own deep fascial line and how your tongue is connected into that. Just close your eyes and just get a sense of it. I needed to strive for balance because I was feeling it mm -hmm. through the hips and sacrum for sure. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Want to share? Yes. I don't know if I'm imagining it, but I'm, since I'm all stretched out on the floor, I was playing with flexing my feet and seeing if it did anything to my tongue. And, and it felt like if I shift them from side to side, it's uh, it's not your imagination. Absolutely not. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I can feel the floor of my mouth um, elevate when I plantar flex my feet. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. you got I mean, yeah. how cool is this? Mm. It's so awesome, and this is the opportunity of working with the tongue-tied baby, of going in here and releasing all that fascia. So it doesn't just end with the phrenotomy, right? <laughs> Yay, we get to go in there and just do this overall body haul, you know? It's this great thing to set that kid up for life going down the road. Yes? So that this is like mind-blowing for me because um, because you know, once we get get the phrenotomy, you know, the tongue clip. Sometimes when we just can't can't make a difference immediately, mm -hmm. this is why. And yikes! So yay! So how many? <laughs> <laughs> yay! Yay! Um, so how many treatments would we would be a guide to our families for? Um, Two to three. What I'm finding 
yeah. is that, and I said I'm kind of early on in, in uh, sort of formalizing this, you know, for myself of understanding what needs yeah. to happen is that two to three treatments pre phrenotomy if I can get them yeah. in. That's yeah, because yeah. when we get them and we get someone doing it, I mean, they're they're doing it like that day for us. Yeah, well, that's great. That's yeah. great. And I'm right there. So, you know, they come into my office. Uh, I'm doing the assessment, and immediately I'm on it, and I'm doing a treatment. Right. And, uh, and so while we're waiting for the doc then, since I can't perform the phrenotomy, right. waiting for the appointment with the doc, then I squeeze in as many other treatments as I can to prime things. And inevitably... I know that when I hit the wall with the treatment, I'm bumping up against the fr the frenulum at that point, the tongue tie. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it's so I'm I'm trying to squeeze in two to three, and then when they come back, it's taking me depending on what kind of comorbidity I have, mm -hmm. somewhere around two to three to straighten everything out if the breastfeeding alone isn't doing the exercise. And you would know that because you're not able to get a decent latch even after the phrenotomy would give you an indication. Well, that we might get a latch, but we're not getting good sex while a brief coordination. Right, and you're yeah. not getting good transfer, and mom's not getting good comfort. And, okay. Yeah. So, so you know, that, and then if there's comorbidity, of course, it may take longer from there. Yeah. Um, rarely these days do I do eight treatments. And my treatments okay. are 30 to 40 minutes long, typically. Do you want another question? You want me to wait? Uh, go ahead. And well, then I'll get you guys. I don't want to hijack with a question. I just wanted to ask about, um, I'm thrilled awareness is growing, and I see a huge tongue-tie population. What I get now that awareness has increased, I get the backlash of everyone that thinks there's a tongue-tie, and there's not, but instead of seeing me or someone else knowledgeable first, they'll go get clipped. And there's, I'm seeing the aftermath and seeing tissues that have been assaulted. And, and how do we help this healing for maybe a clip that might have not been necessary or maybe was necessary, but now we're healing and maybe we're not the first they've seen. I don't know if you want to do that now or later, but that's just I what I want to throw I think that's such a wonderful question that needs to be asked. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I do a lot of work with the shock component of it. So the trauma is either, either the tissues are in shock or the whole organism is in shock. And so I like to use homeopathic remedies that I actually load straight into the field. So I'm not even giving them orally to the baby. I will load in a, sometimes the highest potency I have ever loaded into a baby system is a 1M orum, gold, deep bone chilling shock wow. and but usually stepping down from that <laughs> i will load in like um uh, maybe a 30c uh aconite for emotional yeah. trauma or maybe some trauma so i'm getting the nerve um uh, changes and the reduced inflammation and the article at once in, in a product called trauma and i like stathosagria on its own for incision like shock uh -huh. but that assaulted tissue just just putting your hands on it just feel, you feel the shock coming through it right right or you can feel the perturbation that doesn't go anywhere and sometimes what you have to do is just activate that tissue enough to increase the energy level of it so that you can then push over the chaos attractor into change. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things where, again, you treat what you find, right? But the shock remedies are so useful here. And I'm finding more and more um, with this a horrid birth scene that we have going on that um, that it works better for me to do a shock remedy to begin with and maybe I'm just in a little bit of a low potency maybe a 12 and then I do a midline thing so this is the coolest thing uh, I had an OT in my community who is now boo, boo, who does Moscatova work and um, and she showed me a little trick and with the use of intention, you just simply place your hand, one on this hip, one on the shoulder like so, and intend for the midline to emerge, even if it's not going to stay, prior to treating with the cranial work. And you just ask the midline to show itself. So hands here, and then switch, and do this. 
and the midline will show itself to you and then I proceed with the cranial treatment and I get a lot farther in a single treatment. Now the midline then may disappear, so to speak, okay, we know it's always there, but in terms of just being really obvious and the baby being able to attune to the midline goes away. And then the next time the baby comes in, I repeat that process before I even start the treatment. And I'm getting much better results, much faster. Oh, great. And it just helps the whole system to kind of calm down. Yes? Uh, you said you do treatment treatments pre-surgery. Um, how close together are the closest would you do those two different treatments? Um, I do my treatments um, about two days apart, two to three. Mm -hmm. Unless I've got a system that says, ah, <coughs> slower, I can't do my integration well. But you say you spend a lot of time with integration with the end of your son's handle. Uh, I intend for integration. So, you know, I put the baby back to the breast if the mother's willing to do that. Or, you know, and I'm doing a lot of feeding while I'm actually working on the baby to help with the integration process. And while the baby's at breast, I'm continuing to intentionally treat that baby while at breast. And that's oftentimes where the integration would begin to happen. Yes? What did you mean when you said you load the remedies into the field? Are you, are you giving, administering them internally? How are you? Energetically. So you just have it in space? You just think, remedy, go in. And if the body needs to take it up, it'll, get, it'll just get sucked right into the energy field. So you don't even have it in your office. No, because homeopathy is energy. The, the substance is irrelevant. Right? So, and oftentimes, um, now my clients know me now, but, and I don't do this with all my clients because they're not all as um, accepting of, you know, what they consider to be woo-woo stuff because they don't understand it. But instead of carrying remedies, which is an inventory, you know, hassle from a business perspective, I write the remedy on a piece of paper and hand it to them and say, wave this through your kid's field a few times, three times a day. <laughs> you do it with intention. There it is. The piece of paper is the remedy. I'm just going to add one piece that. It really helps if the baby or mom has had some of that in their field, either via the plant or the remedy itself. Your vibration knows that vibration, and it's really easy. It takes it up. In. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I just have all kinds of crazy shit. Just get people do what I did. Love it. Oh, fantastic question. The tongue sweeping and the stretching. We have no clue if this is effective. Okay? We have no clue. This arose at an international affiliation of tongue tie uh, uh, professionals meeting as a experimental thought, okay, that gee, maybe we might see some better results with these babies who don't improve with the phrenotomy alone, that maybe what we really need to do is stretch and help to prevent scar tissue formation, et cetera, and what people are calling regrowth. Now, personally, I've never seen regrowth. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, okay? I'm just saying I haven't seen it. But then I'm treating these babies after the phrenotomy. So I don't know, we don't know what's going on with that, okay? And we don't know if the stretching is helping. There is some anecdotal evidence that some babies are doing breast refusal after the, uh, the maneuver, okay? I, I don't even know what to say about that. I think a lot of moms don't want to do it, and they don't, and they pretend they are, and they don't. And right. I, I don't see them doing that. Well, and you know, if, if that, that kind of stands to like, babies don't fast or bathing. Yeah, they don't like it. Yeah, yeah, they they don't don't like it. Right. A mother has already been through this process along with her baby. So maybe the shock remedy should also go to the mama. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, sure. um, and so, you know, to add that on when, gee, my baby may balk at this, and then when I go to put them to breast, they're like going, what, you want to stick a finger in my mouth again? Gee, maybe I'm going to just shut down. So I think that's a valid concern about the, you know, the impact of doing that kind of aggressive stuff. Larry's a firm believer in it, you know, but when surgeons are recommending this kind of stuff, 
Remember, they're only doing one little slice right. of the care. And, um, and sometimes, um, uh, frustratingly, they're not paying attention to the therapists who are saying, but, 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 but. Okay, let's look at this from the bigger perspective. Because I'm the one who's doing the pre-work, and I'm the one who's going to be doing the stuff after you do your surgery thing. And so maybe under those circumstances, it would be better for the surgery to be part of the total therapeutic process with one individual. So I'm going to be advocating for lactation consultants to have this in their scope of practice to do for non -medical. Okay, so our comorbidity stuff is going to be along the trajectory of uh, childbirth issues, okay, intrauterine problems, and um, maybe some procedures that occur in the postpartum period. Because as we know, our hospital birth scenario involves doing a lot of extraneous garbage crap, taking the baby away from the mother so that you can give them a bath. Um, you know, you can, I have a much patience for that crap. Circumcision, all of that kind of crap. You know, and still today, in as much as, as we have bitched and bitched and bitched about hospital procedures, we still see pacifiers and bottles put into the baby's little cribby thingy with a nipple shield. With a nipple shield. I respect you all. Another nipple hey. shield thing. <laughs> to me, it's still a scourge. <laughs> and I'm going to try your maneuver because I think it's magical. Thank you. I can't wait until I get home. And I am manifesting right in this moment that I have a baby who's on a nipple shield that comes into my office. And I can just try this maneuver. Okay. Okay, so now. Here's what I do in terms of my assessment, in addition to just my cranial piece, in addition to what I'm doing as a lactation consultant. The 
there's they seem less full. It's kind of if it looks on it doesn't have Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The whole latch looks good. Yeah, right. It looks good, but it is good. Yeah. Okay. Just a few. So he's had two, only two in the last 24? Yeah. I mean, so I talked about the transfer of things like BMs. How many BMs has the baby passed? Uh, you know, let, let me know if are we actually getting calories into this baby. Okay, now look at this nipple. Ow. Where's the wince? <laughs> yeah, look at that upper lip. <laughs> okay, so now I'm starting to do a little bit more hands on here. to the point where I don't even necessarily need to put my hands on somebody. Well, 
what you thought about town, how often the ladies would have a, uh, a poop? A poop? Yeah, how often? Should... No, newborn babies up to eight weeks of age need to be pooping multiple times a day. It is not true that breastfed babies will go for days without a BM. That's bullshit. Allison, don't ruin my talk. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> she is going to be talking about all of that. Okay, so our treatment of tongue tie includes body work, surgery, and lactation therapy. So your pre-surgery goal is to resource the system, address the trauma, if it's there, address intrauterine issues if they're there, address childbirth issues if they're there, and address postpartum issues if they're there. Post-surgery goal is to resource the system, address the surgery trauma, address muscular imbalances, address tongue tie specific restrictions, resolve global restrictions, and restore global physiology. <laughs> Uh, restore, rewire, suck, swallow, breathe, the brain stem and brain pathway levels, and ignite the organism. Yes. That's all you have to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's it's really it's really really like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to move on here because I want to show you treatment. Okay. Here's Asher. Four months old, tongue tied, diagnosed but not treated early because that he was told, or mom was told that it will stretch. Okay? <clears throat> Bull crap. It doesn't stretch, folks. The inherent elasticity of your connective tissue is the inherent elasticity of your connective tissue. Okay? <laughs> you can't make a rubber band with a certain capacity stretch any farther than what its fibers will allow. Right? Make sense? But how come everybody is told that it'll, it gets a little stretchier by the time they're about 18 months old? Well, that's just bull crap. Just, yeah. well, I mean, you know, why did they the believe it? Well, people can yeah. believe anything they want to believe. Well, rubber bands do um, stretch. My first son I mean, had tongue tie, but it was, um, it was uh, anterior, and I, it didn't it didn't affect him. And so he actually got put in 11 because he did not kissing. And, um, and he said it would stretch, but then it would tighten. It would stretch and tighten, so it sort of it wouldn't create, I think, overall elasticity. Uh -huh. But he would get relief, and then uh, and then it would just recede again. So I thought that was interesting, actually. Interesting, but it wouldn't necessarily stretch past its incapacity for stretch. Right. Yeah. Okay. So okay, he would only nurse sideline, and the mother had to really work hard to get him to even do that. He was gassy, spitting up, and hypersensitive. And there was a history in the family of tongue tie, which tongue tie is hereditary. So I did my assessment for function. bulky that tongue is. Okay, and this is what she was dealing with. Look, he's like going, uh-uh. <laughs> Trying to get away from her as much as possible. And moms take that so personal. Yeah. Oh yeah, she yeah. completely felt rejected here. She was a wonderful mother and very distressed by this whole thing. 
Had she successfully breastfed her other kids? Yes. Even though they were ten years old. No, um, the dad is just a different thing. Yeah, I, I, oh, okay. I can't remember the detail on that. Total change. I mean, this baby just was like going, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Did you have your first yeah. with him? Hmm? How many, was that your first with him? You I did two treatments on him. And this was one of two or two? One of two. And then we fine tune next treatment. So, did he have it? Did they have it? Oh, yeah. He had a phrenotomy. That was post phrenotomy. Oh, okay. You oh, didn't okay. do him before the phrenotomy? Uh, no, I just said, <laughs> let's go get that flip. This is, you know, this is before I went, okay, maybe I'm going to start to do some pre phrenotomy treatment. Um, so it's, it's been a, you know, learning thing for me. Okay, I'm going to show you what phrenotomy looks like. Then I'm going to be done. was ever a bleeder, but it wasn't, really? it was the baby, you know, the baby was a bleeder, it's not that the procedure was done poorly, so it doesn't happen that often. Yeah, it's, it's less, it's less than one percent. Okay, so lactation therapy is going to include all of these things, so the lactation consultant is going to continue to work with this baby to make sure all the other aspects of the situation are taken care of. And so you as the craniosacral therapist are part of the team here in working with these babies. Okay, now my um, office manager said, uh, I didn't send books, but if people want to get a hold of the book, they can call that number right there and we'll give them a 10% discount if they mention Carol Gray Conference. Okay, so those are your keywords when you call in if you want to order the book, Carol Gray Conference. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, that's true. Yes. Phrenectomy is excision of the frenulum. Phrenotomy is incision. Well, in a phrenectomy, they'll put you under, they'll suture your tongue up, and they'll go in and they will um, be using a scalpel or an electrocautery, whatever, obliterate the frenulum, or they'll actually excise it from the mucous membrane on the underside of the tongue, and it creates a certain type of a wound pattern called a deep plastic, and then they stitch all that up. It's really overkill, Far. except for in the rarest of circumstances. If we think it's kind of bad, but it's not bad. Well, you want to assess very, very carefully so that you can determine whether or not there is substantial enough other stuff going on with the birth history that would match your findings, like vacuum extraction or forceps delivery or C-section delivery, that could pull the tongue into the throat causing the frenulum to appear as a mature annular type. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's really well put. Can you say that again? Yeah. Okay, so you can have um, interventions, whether it be asynclitic presentation or an intrauterine lie issue, twins or whatever, 
and or intrapartum issues that can influence the positioning of the tongue in the throat. So pulling the tongue back into the throat can create an appearance of the frenulum that looks short and or tight and isn't. Okay? So that's where we need to be very careful assessors. Oh, it, I mean, there's a laundry list. Those are just, you know, some of the most heinous things yeah. that can happen. Okay, yes? Oh, I was just going to say, that's why hundreds of them are done by observation, not necessarily by right. functional it. assessment. Right. Because I can't think of hundreds that I have sent out in the, you know, in the world in 17 years. It's always been on function versus, you know, oh, look at Judy, it's cranula. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of unnecessary procedures. Right. Right. Yeah. What is the compelling evidence? Like, other than I know there's not a lot of nerves under there, but the, the no even local for babies. Like, because there are very few nerve endings in that area and it's very poorly vascularized. I had now I'm a case of one. Granted, okay. I had a phrenotomy done when I was 42 years old without anesthetic, and it did not hurt, and I could barely even feel the pressure of the scissors. Okay, so we're now doing toddlers without anesthesia. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so they're they're crying like that because they don't, they don't like things right now. Even your mouth is a part of it. Yeah. You know, it sort of it's better hurts. But I don't think it does. I think it's being no. held down. I think it. Does. I think here, look at your nail. Just don't go too deep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, go you know. deep enough to get rid yeah. of the problem. But yeah. Yes. So um, when I've heard some people say the, that the phrenotomy is not deep enough, yeah. it's, it's not getting in there far enough, yeah. and, and if you sweep under, there's like a big block in the middle. What is that if it's, what is it that needs to happen to allow the tongue to move more if, if the phrenotomy has been done but the tongue's not moving? Well, I suspect that we've probably got something going on fascially that's you know, at the root uh, or the base of the tongue that's holding it in place. Because if the phrenotomy is done to, you know, to incise the frenulum per se, then, you know, you should get freedom of the tongue unless you've got to go and do some other work. But it's often not done completely. It'll be a cosmetic little release. Oh, yeah. Okay. There may be a cos yeah, it's just a teensy tiny little clip yeah. and, okay, I've, d I, I've done it, instead of going all the way back to the base of the tongue. So let's say it's been done twice, uh, both by competent people, and there's still very little tongue function. Well, then we have to start thinking about what else is going on here. So what I heard is that it, it can take up to two weeks after the phrenotomy for things to even start getting better. Is that completely not? Well, it may take um, breastfeeding and some therapy, et cetera, to strengthen weaken muscles in order to get the baby ship shape and able to transfer milk effectively. So yes, that may very well be true. Yes. 